Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn. And today's guest is Hannah Lukowski, who is going to give us some interesting insight into what it's like to be a part of a, a established brand like Firehouse Subs, and then to be a franchisee with a smaller startup brand with Chicken Salad Chick. And so she's living in both worlds right now. And I, and I don't have a lot of QSR people on here. And I wanted to have someone that, that can give us insight into both worlds and into the QSR world, especially someone that didn't come from that world. I mean, she was a, a farmer's daughter in a town of 200 people who quickly found herself flying around on private jets around the country. And um, I'm just gonna stop there and let her kind of fill in the blanks on the rest of the story. So Hannah, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Definitely. So now we were talking earlier and you started telling me about like how you got into the private jet industry and like super young, doing some really cool things and you experienced a bunch of freedom and that's really what drove you into franchising eventually. So can you give us some insight into like who you are? Sure. So I grew up in a very small town in central Illinois. Uh, my dad's a fourth generation farmer. So I grew up um, understanding the hard work it takes to own your own business. I also saw the flexibility of um, my dad kind of come and go and just make sure his job was done, but he was also very um, involved as a father. Um, so I went off to college, got a degree in public relations, and quickly realized that public relations was not my forte. But instead, I was like, I love meeting and talking to people, so sales sounds like a great avenue. Um, and so I got into um, the private jet world. Um, I sold fuel for private jets for a couple of years and then um, worked for a company that sold services for satellite communication systems on private jets. So basically, if you are CEO of a company like Yum Brands and you're flying from Kentucky all the way to Shanghai, you have 12 hours of uninterrupted time on a jet. Um, so Wi-Fi and phone services are extremely important for you to get work done. Um, so those are the services that I sold. Um, so it was, it was phenomenal. Did that for about five years and traveled all over the country uh, for that. And so then you, I mean, that's cool. I, did, I didn't know about your father. My dad was the same way, um, grew up with a lot of flexibility. And even though he had that flexibility, he chose to spend it with us kids growing up. And that had a profound impact on me. And it sounds like it was similar to you because that's kind of why you went from that world that gave you some freedom and flexibility into franchising. So give us some, um, how did you make that leap from private jet world into franchising? Yeah, so I was in my late 20s. Um, my husband has a taxing job that requires him to travel a great deal. Um, he works for the federal government, so he has a pension and an early retirement. So when we got to the point of wanting to have kids, we started talking about what our life would look like. And really, it looked like me not being very involved with my kids' lives. Um, and so when I decided I needed to leave that, that world that I was used to, I was like, I cannot go back to somebody telling me to be at work at eight and work till five and have, you know, two weeks of paid vacation a year. Um, so I just started researching different franchises. Um, and that's kind of where I just decided like, hey, I wanted to own my own business, but I wasn't really creative. I couldn't create something, but the franchise concept made a lot of sense to me. It was a proven system that had worked. And I was like, well, I can, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I can work hard and I can follow a system. So that's where I just thought, my work style and franchising really meshed perfectly. And so a lot of people initially go to food. They think that's where they want to go. They think they want a subway or something like that until they start to research it. And then they realize that's not what they want for various reasons, but it is what you ended up going into. And you bought into firehouse subs and it sounds like you grew that smartly over the years, but um, like what drove you to eventually make that decision to go into the food industry? What were some of the things that scared you about that? And, and like, were they as scary once you got into it um, as you thought they would be? So the reason I kind of picked food was because of a, a lot because of the hours. Um, you know, Firehouse Subs closed at nine o'clock. I did do a lot of research into brands like Dunkin' Donuts, but they're open around the clock. Um, I didn't think, and I still don't think that I will forever be in the QSR segment of franchising, but I thought it was something to dip my toe into and learn relatively quickly at a young age. Um, Firehouse Subs was ready to expand in the St. Louis market, and I knew I could build multiple units relatively quickly. And also the price point of 
per unit, I was very comfortable with. Um, so how old were you when you opened up your first one? I was 28. 28. So young still. And, and you opened up your first one, like any big, big things that you learned? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like they were, you know, you can look at them two ways. Like the first thing I did was I was the general manager at my first location. I had just given up a very big salary. So I was like, I can't expect somebody to come in and run my restaurant if I don't know how to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I ran the first one for the first year. So it took a long time for me to teach my staff to rely on the next person who was filling my shoes because they were so used to coming to me. Um, and so I feel like sometimes I'm like, was that a mistake? But I also look at all the things I learned from that. Um, you know, and that, that just kind of carried on to the second to the third one um, is when I open a new one, I have been lucky enough to promote from within. Um, so that has helped a lot with my growing process, but also because I know how to do everything, I'm behind the line working with the staff. So then I feel like it's, I've spent a little less time wearing like an owner's hat and deep diving into a lot of the numbers and marketing and things that I should have probably done a little bit more, but instead I was so focused on inside my four walls. Well, I think that's, um, I want to get into chicken salad chick, but you mentioned something there that I think a lot of people, um, uh, I get questions from a lot of people about is like, how do you promote from within? And if you're running a lean ship, it's really hard to promote from within. Or if you only have one location and you don't have a plan to open up more, it's harder to start to preparing to promote from within because you really don't need to. And if you have one location, then your key person leaves, then you're like starting from, from, you know, ground zero again. So give us some of your, your philosophy, things that you've learned, why you, you know, the advantages of having multiple locations and at least being able to, and then being able to promote from within. Yeah, so I kind of take it back to when I was in aviation and I was in sales. I wanted a goal not only to hit sales-wise, but I wanted a goal for me to grow within the company. And I feel like being a young professional, that if you don't have growth within the current company you're working for, you're going to look outside. So I felt like I really had to instill that into my people. Um, so when I opened my first location, I was very transparent. Hey, if you guys work hard, there's, you know, if you're a normal team member, there's room for growth within, um, you know, a shift leader to potentially an assistant manager to a GM, all my higher up people, I said, Hey, like I am looking to grow, you know, and I always was very transparent with my team. Hey, I now have a lease for my second location. We're beginning construction. We'll be open in four months. And I feel like that just allowed my current workers to work hard because they could see immediate promotions within the company. Yeah, because they're used to one. I, I, they people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want opportunity for growth, and what we see as growth, they may not. You know, and I've talked to a number of people that started out like as a cook somewhere, and then rose to the CEO level of a of an organization, big organization. And that's something that I do within my businesses is I, you always talk about the big picture, right? If you, even though as us as owners, we go in and we have one location, we're getting ready to start and we don't know everything, how everything's going to work out. We don't, we just don't, aren't comfortable with it all, but we need to have a vision ourselves of how we're going to grow, whether it's two units or three or 10 or 20 or whatever it is, you paint that vision and that with vision comes opportunity for your team members. And if you do that, you're going to attract the right kind of people. If you don't do that and you're just focused on, it's just an hourly job or a small salary job and there's no, and you're not painting the picture of opportunity for growth, then you're just going to get stuck with people that are there temporarily and they're never going to want to do more and be more. Absolutely. I completely agree. Any, um, give us a story of someone that was promoted from within. Yeah. So actually my right hand person, her name's Shelby. She was my first interview. So when I was opening my first location, I put ads on everything from like, this is when Craigslist wasn't super scary. So I put ads <laughs> on Craigslist. I put ads on Indeed, um, all different sorts of things. So she was actually my first interview. I interviewed her at a Panera bread company because the store wasn't even open and um, she was a 20 year old, um, looking for something out of her current job. She'd never worked in food before. Um, and she is now my director of operations. She knows both brands and she is 
amazing. I mean, she literally, you give her a task that five years ago terrified her, for example, public speaking. And now she'll go to a charity event and she will get pulled on stage and she will explain everything about uh, our charities that we run and things that we do for the community and giving back. And she loves it. And she has just, she has been my biz, biggest success story. And I couldn't be here today without her. We all need people like that. You know, I've got people like that. I've had people like that in the past. I think about them probably on a weekly basis. The people that are in my life, like Don at, you know, Liberty Tax back in Austin, Texas. So Don, if you're listening, you were one of those guys. And I had a number of you as we were, as I was growing things, I look back and like, these guys were so critical to my, to my growth. And as an owner, with people like that, that are your right hand person, like you want them to succeed and you want, and I've had one Mirko who worked for me in the salon business and he's now a multi-brand, multi-unit franchisee. And so it's great seeing these people that were helping you in your journey all of a sudden, you know, and sometimes surpass you in, in their journey. So let's go into chicken salad chick. Uh, that is probably the opposite of like brand name recognition um, as, as like firehouse subs is I've heard of it and I, and I've heard, you know, things about it, but I'd love you to kind of tell me who, who they are and like your journey into finding them. Yeah. So they actually started 10 years ago. It was a stay at home mom that was going through a divorce and realized she was a couple hundred dollars shy every week of making her bills. Um, and so she started making chicken salad and selling it at her son's little league games or to friends that she knew for a baby shower. Um, health department stopped, knocked on her door and said, you can't do this. Um, and so she opened a small restaurant named chicken salad after her favorite chicks in her life. <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, so it's it's a very cool concept. Um, so actually, my best friend from college is their director of marketing. So she joined the company seven years ago. They were very small, had about six locations. And um, her and I just really talked about franchising and about the growth and just what franchising was all about. Um, so I had met with the founder six years ago. And they were just like, you know, we're, we're definitely not ready to move to the Midwest. At the time I was living in St. Louis. So they're like, we're not ready to move to St. Louis. We're only in Alabama and Georgia. We need to move very slowly because brand recognition isn't there. So you fast forward to now, um, they have 145 locations. Um, they're as far north as Illinois. They're as far west as um, Texas. Um, and so it is a fast casual concept focusing on 12 different varieties of chicken salad. Um, and they also have sandwiches, soups, um, things like that. So, um, very cool concept. So how many firehouses do you have now? And then how many chicken salads do you have? So I have, um, three firehouse subs locations. And then I have one chicken salad chick location that opened up three months ago and we are under construction for our next for a second one. So how did you, did you um, sign those leases or in signed LOI um, back to back? So you were fully committed with two right away or was there some overlap? Yeah, I was fully committed to two right away. I actually thought the second location would be the location that would open up first, but it's everything's new construction, new development. So anybody who's dealt with new development knows it's hurry up and then you wait. Um, That's so true. Let's talk about that a little bit because um, a lot of people that I help find franchises for, they call me up and they're like, Eric, I don't have a location yet. I'm like, that's very normal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or it's like, oh my gosh, it's going faster than I thought. I'm like, that's very normal. So once you go from signing franchise agreements to finding a location, whether any type, we're talking retail right now, any type of retail might be new construction, might be white box, gray box or whatever, the different stages of where that uh, retail locations being delivered to you as a tenant, um, there's different timelines attached to that. And so some of the delays in it, what I've seen is attorney, the LOI is usually a long drawn out process. It's an important part of the process, but then you get attorneys involved. And depending on how your attorney is and how their attorney is, it can either go really smoothly and you get to the end, the, the end result quickly, or it could take forever. And then there is, once you get it delivered and going through the city and the permitting process and all that, 
So it, th the point of it is it never goes exactly like you think it's going to go. And you just had one location one actually be location number two and vice versa. So anything else that you would add to that things that you've experienced? So I actually was in a six month process to getting an LOI approved um, on this location that's currently under construction. Um, and it was a very large um, real estate group that was putting it together. So as you know, the larger the group is, it seems mm -hmm. like the slower the process goes. Yeah. So I actually suggested at the point where I was just frustrated because it was taking so long to go back and forth. I just suggested, hey, let's everybody get on a call. Get your attorney, yep. my attorney, mm -hmm. everybody that we could possibly need on one call and just go through this checklist because we yep. were able to solve all the issues so much quicker than waiting on emails to go back and forth. Yep. And that's, I'm at that stage right now in one of my LOIs, uh, no, not LOIs, we're with attorneys right now. They've gone back and forth a handful of times. And um, I just played that card. Let's everybody get on the phone call because sometimes that just, you know, brings the tension down and um, lets everybody know where they are real quickly. So, and then you can see how your attorney is on the call too. And you don't, yeah, and absolutely. you, they need to do what you ask them to do. If you want them to be really aggressive, then they are really aggressive. If you want them to lay back a little bit and not be so aggressive, then they should do that too. They should do what you're wanting them to do. And it should really be a team effort. Like, you know, you working with them because they know things that you don't know, but, um, but yeah, that's a super important piece of it. So now you are part of two different brands right now, very different stages of their growth. How many, so 100, 100 plus with Chicken Salad Chick, how many locations does Firehouse have at this point? I think they're at like 1250, 1250. Yeah, so they're in Puerto Rico, they're in uh, Canada, all across the United States. Um, they've been around for 25 years, whereas Chicken Salad Chick is mostly in the South and mm -hmm. growing towards the Midwest. Um, 150 ish locations in 10 years. So yep. completely different brands. So, so very different brands. And when I think about brands like that, and I've been a part of both of them super early stage and then, and, and, you know, a younger nimble, uh, organization versus a large organization that just makes decisions very differently. Sometimes it's really slow or it's just done through the lens of a very large organization. So you being in the food industry with two different brands, kind of do some compare and contrast. Okay, so the most recent example I have is when I was in training for Chicken Salad Chick, obviously with a fast casual restaurant, labor is one of your biggest components. Um, and so when I was in training, um, Chicken Salad Chick, with every meal, you get a small cookie. Um, it's the founder just said um, that every meal should end with something sweet. So we get these little cookies that if the meal was dining, you would actually cut the cookie out of the packaging and put it on the tray. So it was taking 15 to 20 minutes every single shift for people to open these cookies to then put them on the tray. And what we were noticing in training was that most people did not even eat their cookie in the restaurant. They wrapped it up in a napkin, put it in their purse and took it home. So we suggested like, hey, to save labor, let's keep it in this nice packaging that is specifically for chicken salad chick on the tray. Within two weeks, they had had that approved because they looked at it and they're like, gosh, you guys are so right. And it wasn't just that like my training group had suggested it. Um, restaurants in the, in the industry and out in the market had suggested it as well. But with Firehouse, I feel like because it's such a big brand, they have to do case studies and, you know, they talk about it for like months of months on end. Mm -hmm. And then you're not even sure if it ever gets anywhere. Um, so I will say with Firehouse, there's been very small changes that have happened that I have seen within the five years of me being involved in the brand, just because it's so slow to react. Let's talk, speaking of reaction, we have some little kid, one, is that one or two little kids in the background? <laughs> There's two. So I have a There's... newborn and then I have a two and a half year old. <laughs> so this is, is, so if you do hear some little kids in the background, they are not mine, although well, they very well could be because I have little kids that would do the exact same thing, but this is life of a mom that's an entrepreneur. So like, this is totally fine to have this on this show because I mean, this is, this is your life. And, um, and I know that you're in the middle of a move too. So you got a lot of things going on right now. So thank you for taking some time out to, to do this with us. Um, so any advice like on positioning yourself as a franchisee within a big and a small organization to be able to get your voice heard 
or to be able to have someone on the inside that is like your advocate? I don't think it really matters how big the company is. I think it's just very important to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's what I lost sight of the first year um, that I was in franchising because I was so focused on within my four walls of my restaurant, making sure everything was right. And I was so tied up in, um, you know, four to six minute ticket times, which is our target ticket time for firehouse subs. I was just so tied up in that and any kind of bad review, like, I would just focus on very small issues. Um, but I would say it's when I got my second location opened, I realized, hey, I need to be more active from a franchisee perspective and involved with corporate because every decision corporate makes affects me as an individual owner. Um, so that's the only thing I would say is be involved as quick as possible. So more bigger picture stuff because you can't do both. You can't be, I was just talking to one of my managers about this the other day. I'm like, you can get so focused and it's so easy to be in the store. And I need you out of the store. I want you to be involved and to know what's going on and all that. But I can't have you, you know, it's fine if you want to clean the toilets once. So everybody knows that you're not above that. But don't make that your job, you know, because you need to be doing doing other things, focusing on other things, because that's managing. That That is like, you know, you need to understand the big picture. And as a franchisee, you know, it's fine doing a lot of that stuff for a season, but, but pull yourself out of that, build relationships in corporate, know what's going on and with your other franchisees, because that you can move the needle more in your business by doing that than like being super involved in their business, not being able to, to see the forest through the trees, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, relationships inside like you know there's been there have been um for myself in the past in different franchises i like to have somebody there that is like my go-to person that i can that i have access to i have their cell phone number and i'll treat them well whether that's a gift or you know just different things but i like to have somebody on the inside of the organization that will let me know what's going on and not secrets or things like that but just you know i want to be in the know as something that could impact my business and uh, do you have you ever had those types of relationships on the inside yeah, so with Firehouse, I uh, related very quickly to one of the VPs, um, and we would exchange emails and phone calls just about life outside Firehouse yep. Sub. So we actually were able to engage in a personal connection. So when I had my first daughter, you know, she immediately emailed me, checking in to see how I was doing. But I feel like it is it, it is absolutely perfect to have that person that's a go to that you can kind of vent to, but also just to work like they learn from you just as mm -hmm. you learn from them yeah. um so i do have that within firehouse and then chicken solid chick i've had to be very careful because my best friend is their director of marketing so i always tell her like when we talk we'll laugh because i'll be like okay i'm taking off my franchisee hat i'm talking <laughs> to my best friends because you know like i respect her job just as she respects mine but like yeah. sometimes i just want to vent to her as my best friend about things that frustrate me or you know issues i'm having um, but then I've also had to create those relationships with other people inside corporate, with inside Chicken Salad Chick that I have that relationship with. So I'm not directly only going through my best friend. I mean, I think that's important to say. I mean, there you said frustrated with corporate with. And I think every franchisor is going to get frustrated with franchisees and franchisees get frustrated with corporate. There, and, and at some point, you know, that kind of mellows out and evens out. But that's normal. I mean, it's, it's okay to have that. And that's how brands get better. And that's how franchisees get better because a franchisee is not always right. And neither is the franchisor. So um, you were mentioning how you just moved. You moved from St. Louis St. to Louis Phoenix. To Phoenix. Yeah. Is it nice there right now? It's like it's freezing where I am right it's now. It's 75 and sunny. Like, oh my gosh. Tell me about the move. Like, why did you move? And then tell me about the businesses. Are all the chicken salad chicks in St. Louis still? They are. So um, my husband actually had a great opportunity for advancement um, within the federal government. Um, so that was just another reason that franchising stood out to me. Um, in five years ago was I, I'm very career driven and so is my husband. So I wanted to be able to support him. And as we know nowadays, most of the time in order to get a promotion, you have to move. Um, so we actually were in Madison, Wisconsin um, for nine months and then have recently relocated to Phoenix. So drastic difference between Madison and Phoenix. 
Um, but this, one of the great things about franchising is it allows me to still own and operate businesses regardless of where I live. That's what I think, as you were saying that so many people get caught up on like, I want to have a business here and it's good to have a business where you live. Right. Um, but if that's like the end and you have to be married to that business in your market, it just, you don't have the flexibility to move, whether it's a spouse that gets a job or you just get tired of the cold South Dakota winters and it's time to, you know, move to someplace warm in the winters. You know, I like, I did it, um, by accident. That's all I knew was semi-absentee ownership out of state. Um, but I, I'm glad I fell into that. I think we were talking earlier and you learned some things like how your, I mean, your team's doing well, you've got a business over there now and you live in a different, in a different state. Tell me a little bit about some of the things that you've learned having a, two different businesses, two different brands in a different state from where you live. Um, so when I lived in St. Louis, it was all my locations were within 30 minutes of my house. So every day when I got up, I would take my daughter to school and then I would go to one of the businesses, spend about half the day and then go to another one. So I carried my laptop with me wherever I went, but um, being that 70% of our business happens during lunch at around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I would go help at some part of the restaurant, whether it was running food or helping on the sandwich line or even in the production. Um, and I, it allowed me to build a great rapport with my team, but the problem it created was anytime they were remotely short, it was like, Hey, we'll call Hannah. She will yep. gladly jump over, which was great. But the problem was, is I was doing payroll at night. I was deep diving into the numbers at night. So then I was working so many more hours than I probably should have been because I was working at the locations. Um, so you remove yourself from that physical location geographically and you realize they still survived they still ran great numbers for lunch and they were able to get through the tickets um, but instead it allows me to at a day-to-day -day time deep dive into labor look at our food costs look at what we're running as far as um, different percentages and where our marketing dollars are going and i feel like i'm able to wear like my owner's hat a little bit more and even be more effective as an owner farther away it's so true and it's it's scary at first and then you just have to do it and sometimes people discover that when they go on vacation and they can't do that and they go on extended you know uh i had mike on here who wrote the book clockwork and he suggests doing something like that how do you know if you're a business owner versus if you have a job he's like go take an extended vacation and like don't get involved with your business for like a month or two months or whatever that time is then you understand if you have a business that's really running and that's you know that's exactly what you what you did and it's so easy as business owners once you're back in it to get involved and it just becomes normal um to jump back into the lunch rush and doing those types of things but and then there's, i think there's a sense of guilt too as an owner if you're not there and your team knows that you're not there right. if you are local you know at least i used to i used to feel guilty for not being around when they were at the busiest time when i know that well, necessarily wasn't the highest and best use of my time yeah and i also felt and this is something that i still struggle with i also felt the need to explain to my employees what i was doing and where my time was being allotted you know like i would always tell them like hey i'm leaving this location but i'm going to be at this location until four and you know then it's like wait why i don't need to justify that because are they up at midnight when i'm doing payroll Yep. No, you know, like, so that's something that I still to this day struggle with is the justification of what as an owner I am doing. Yeah. I think what you'll find is being a part of two different brands will give you the freedom to be able to be like, I'm working on other stuff and you don't even need to know about it because they, they, it, it, they think because you have two brands, like they'll know, like, boy, they must be busy or they're, you know, she's working really hard over here or not. It doesn't matter. But I think there's something with a couple different brands, because at least on my team, people that are, you know, my either operational business partners or key leaders in the businesses, like I never feel that way anymore. And I used to, but I think they, and, and I'm always out doing cool stuff. So it's not like I'm always working, you know, right. and they know that too, but at the same time, like they're happy about that. Um, but so, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting thing. I like getting involved with conversations like this that are just real, like how we feel and I'm embarrassed to say this, or I'm, you know, I, I really do think this because I think what you just voiced is how a lot of business owners feel. Um, anything else that you would 
that you found um, interesting being a part of both of those brands, or at least now being like a new semi-absentee owner living, living out of state? Any big, big takeaways or things that you're concerned about or scared about or just don't know about yet? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still concerned. I mean, obviously, we're going back to the Midwest for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. So this, I feel like this first month and a half, two months was a nice little trial period, because then it's like, oh, I can go check in for a week and then, you know, be gone for three weeks. So I think um, the beginning of the year will really be like, it'll settle in to everybody. Um, but I'm still struggling with how to exactly manage my time, how mm -hmm. much to communicate with them. You know, because I at first, the first couple weeks out here, I felt myself checking in every day on the phone just because I could. And then it was like, wait, when I was in St. Louis, I didn't call all of my general managers every day. Um, so it's definitely just a learning curve for me. So what I have, I'd be interested to know how you are doing it, but I have a once a week uh, phone call with or Zoom with my team. So the uh, other operational, other partners and and uh, district operational managers or key leadership. And we do, it's either a 30 to 60 minute meeting. There's an agenda most of the time, not all the time, um, but there's a, ideally an agenda and we just go through it and we're there and then we're done. And that way, anything that the managers can, that they have during the week, that is a question. They know on Thursdays, they'll get an answer to that. If they need it sooner, then they'll reach out. Um, and then there are daily and weekly KPI reports that they send. And I try to keep those real high level. So I'll just know if something's wrong, like if there's zero sales for the day, something's wrong, you know, right. but, but those are real high level. How are you managing that right now? So I'm kind of doing something similar. Um, so I have a director of operations that's in St. Louis. So she has a very flexible schedule. She is not on any schedule for any of the locations and she just kind of floats, but she will give me her schedule the week before. And then we map out based on where she's at um, when we have calls with the GMs of each location. Um, so that's kind of how I'm I'm KPIs? Doing. Do you have KPIs that she gets? Does she get the KPIs and then roll them up to you or do they report them to you? So they, all the GMs at this point report them to me. Um, you know, we do an end of day sales report that I get the report every single day and then I give her a weekly report um, and we kind of go from there about the goals for the week. Um, and then I still schedule out because Chicken Salad Chick's such a new brand mm -hmm. um, and we're relatively unknown, we're doing a ton of marketing. So her and I will brainstorm for the next week what our focus is on marketing the brand. That's good. I like it. Sounds like uh, you've got a, a good thing going. And then one last thing, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, you are, this is important, like, and I, I respect Chicken Salad Chick for this. They didn't let you open up in St. Louis right away. They waited until they were ready for you to open up. And the same thing in Arizona, right? They're not ready just because they have someone that has experience opening a chicken salad chick. They are not ready to say, yeah, go for it because they have a plan and they're sticking to their plan, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the biggest things, like, even though I love chicken salad chick and I love the concept because of Firehouse, I learned so much about the franchisor. You know, and one thing that I was concerned about is chicken salad is a Southern thing. Like, how is it going to do in an area that has relatively cold weather in the winter? Um, so I really maintained that thought process when I went down to meet with them for the first time is I wanted them to sell me the brand just as much as I knew I was selling myself to them. Um, and the biggest thing that I respected that I didn't anticipate was the CEO of Chicken Salad Chick was a franchisee from Wendy's. So okay. with, he had owned at one time, I believe, 30 locations. So having the CEO sit mm. at the head of a company that used to be in your position, yeah. I grew instant respect for yep. um, because he understood the decisions he's making affect your bottom dollar. Yeah. Um, and so one thing that he had said is he was like, we have to grow this brand slowly and, and grow it the right way in order for us to be a nationwide brand. And he said, we're not going to jump over states. Um, so we are going to develop very slow and make sure that we have a good presence and that our name recognition is there before we move on to the next state. It is so hard for franchisors to do that when they have franchisees that are ready to open up. But if it's the best thing for the brand and fast, rapid 
fast growth, you know, where you're making all the top 10 lists and all the magazines does not necessarily mean it's the best thing for the franchisor or the best thing for the franchisees. Sometimes there's, there's purpose behind that and being fast with brand recognition and it depends on the type of concept and, and, and the strategy. But I have immense respect for franchisors like them that are doing it the right way and it's really looking out for the franchisees. So um, I love it, I love it, I love it. I know that you're in the um, process of selling some of your firehouses and I want to get into that on another episode with you. So thanks for your time today. Yeah, absolutely.